Obama's novel by Noam Chomsky. The hopes and prospects for peace aren't well aligned, not even close. The task is to bring them nearer. Presumably, that was the intent of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee in choosing President Barack Obama. The prize seemed a kind of prayer and encouragement by the Nobel Committee for Future Endeavor and more consensual American leadership, Stephen Erlanger and Cheryl Gray Stolberg wrote in the New York Times. The nature of the Bush Obama transition bears directly in the likelihood that the prayers and encouragement might lead to progress. The Nobel Committee's concerns were valid. They singled out Obama's rhetoric on reducing nuclear weapons. Right now, Iran's nuclear ambitions dominate the headline. The warnings are that Iran might be concealing something from the International Atomic Energy Agency and violating United Nations Security Council Resolution 1887, passed last month and hailed as a victory for Obama's efforts to contain Iran. Meanwhile, a debate continues on whether Obama's recent decision to reconfigure missile defense systems in Europe is a capitulation to the Russians or a pragmatic step to defend the West from Iranian nuclear attack. Silence is often more eloquent than loud clamor, so let us attend to what is unspoken. Amid the furor over Iranian duplicity, the IAEA passed a resolution calling on Israel to join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and open its nuclear facilities to inspection. The United States and Europe tried to block the IAEA resolution, but it passed anyway. The media virtually ignored the event. The United States assured Israel that it could support Israel's rejection on the resolution, reaffirming a secret understanding that has allowed Israel to maintain a nuclear arsenal close to international inspections, according to officials familiar with the arrangements. Again, the media were silent. Indian officials greeted the United States Resolution 1887 by announcing that India quote, can now build nuclear weapons with the same destructive power as those in the arsenals of the world's major nuclear powers, unquote, the Financial Times reported. Both India and Pakistan are expanding their nuclear weapons programs. They have twice come dangerously close to nuclear war, and the problems that almost ignited this catastrophe are very much alive. Obama greeted Resolution 1887 differently. The day before, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his inspiring commitment to peace. The Pentagon announced it was accelerating delivery of the most lethal non-nuclear weapons in the arsenal, 13-ton bombs for B-2 and B-52 stealth bombers, designed to destroy deeply hidden bunkers shielded by 10,000 pounds of reinforced concrete. It's no secret the bunker busters could be deployed against Iran. Planning for these massive ordnance penetrators began in the post years but languished until Obama called for developing them rapidly when he came into office. Passed unanimously, Resolution 1887 calls for the end of threats of force and for all countries to join the NPT as Iran did long ago. NPT non-signers are India, Israel and Pakistan, all of which developed nuclear weapons with United States help in violation of the NPT. Iran hasn't invaded another country for hundreds of years, unlike the United States, Israel and India, which occupies Kashmir brutally. The threat from Iran is minuscule. If Iran had nuclear weapons and delivery systems and prepared to use them, the country would be vaporized. To believe Iran would use nuclear weapons to attack Israel or anyone, quote, 
amounts to assuming that Iran's leaders are insane, unquote, and they look forward to being reduced to radioactive dust, the strategic analyst Leonard Weiss observes, adding that Israel's missile-carrying submarines are virtually impervious to preemptive military attack, not to speak of the immense United States arsenal. In naval maneuvers in July, Israel sent its Dolphin-class subs, capable of carrying nuclear missiles, through the Suez Canal and into the Red Sea, sometimes accompanied by warships, to a position from which they could attack Iran, as they have a sovereign right to do, according to United States Vice President Joe Biden. Not for the first time, what is veiled in silence would receive front page headlines in societies that valued their freedom and were concerned with the fate of the world. The Iranian regime is harsh and repressive, and no human person wants Iran or anyone else to have nuclear weapons, but a little honesty will not hurt in addressing these problems. The Nobel Peace Prize, of course, is not concerned solely with reducing the threat of terminal nuclear war, but rather with war generally and the preparation for war. In this regard, the selection of Obama raised your brows, not least in Iran surrounded by United States occupying armies. On Iran's borders, in Afghanistan and in Pakistan, Obama has escalated Bush wars and is likely to proceed on that course, perhaps sharply. Obama has made clear that the United States intends to retain a long-term major presence in the region. That match is signaled by the huge city within a city called the Baghdad Embassy, unlike any embassy in the world. Obama has announced the construction of mega embassies in Islamabad and Kabul and a huge consulate in Peshawar and elsewhere. Nonpartisan budget and security monitors report in government executive that the quote, administration's request for $538 billion for the Defense Department in fiscal 2010 and its stated intention to maintain a high level of funding in the coming years put the president on track to spend more on defense in real dollars than any other president has in one term of office since World War II. And that's not counting the additional $130 billion the administration is requesting to fund the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan this year, with even more spending slated for future years." Unquote. The Nobel Prize Committee may well have made truly worthy choices, prominent among them the remarkable Afghan activist Malala Ejoya. This brave woman survived the Russians and then the radical Islamists who brutally was the stream that the population welcomed the Taliban. Joya has withstood the Taliban and now the return of the warlords under the Karzai government. Throughout, Joya worked effectively for human rights, particularly for women. She was elected to parliament and then expelled when she continued to denounce warlord atrocities and now she lives underground, under heavy protection, but she continues the struggle in word and deed. By such actions, repeated everywhere as best as can, the prospects for peace edge closer to hopes.